Hello everyone and welcome to our last talk in our series of the um, Footsteps of Faith. And today we are talking about the unlikely rise of Greece, the nation of Greece. Obviously this morning we talked about the uh, mysteries of the Minoans because tomorrow morning we land on Crete and we will be visiting, if you're going on the excursion, the Palace of Gnosis, the first location identified in the Minoan culture. The following day, we are going to be stopping on, at Monomvasia, which is a, a fascinating Greek city. I'm, I'm assured it's fascinating. I've never been there, but I will in two days. Um, and it is has a long history, including being a Byzantine center and everything else. But from there, we will be going to the ruins of the city of ancient Sparta, um, and also, if, if that's the if that's what you elect to do, and also the possibility of uh, on that trip of going to Mistra, again a Byzantine city. I did put this up again. If anybody has, if you haven't gotten this, don't have a pencil or pen. Just grab me or grab Carolyn over the next couple of days. We'll make sure that you've got the information of our of the website where we will have a page called the Windstar Talks and the videos as well as the PowerPoints that I've been presenting will be available on there so you can access those. As well as if you care to, any of the other uh, classes that I've taught, video of the classes I've taught as part of our seminary in California. Or California, Mexico, where do I live? <laughs> Mexico, I used to live in California. Um, so today, it is the unlikely rise of Greece. Um, you can't read this, but it's really good. This is a chart. <laughs> this is a chart I'm showing you because if you do choose to go on the Winstar Talks page of our litchapala.org website, then you'll be able to see this. Um, it is a timeline of all the major events from the from Greek history, and in fact, it goes quite a bit in that direction and in that direction. I just you know, today I'm going to be talking about the period, particularly around classical Greek. Um, leading up to the, and through the Hellenistic and up to the era of Roman control. But uh, often I will put up charts and things when I teach classes people can't see, but I, I do that so that they'll know, oh, if I go on the website, then I'll be able to look at this and see all of this detail in a really interesting way. Um, while I'm on this page, though, I do want to mention that when we think about Greece, we think about Greece as one of the two great empires or nations, whatever, that uh, along with Rome, that are predecessors to our Western culture. Well, the fact is that while Rome was an empire, uh, Greece, until very modern times, was never either really an empire, although we talk about the Athenian Empire, that's okay. Come on through. We're good. <laughs> um, we're here for you. Not a problem. Um, it was never really an empire. It wasn't even a nation until very recently. Greece had always been, throughout most of the period of time in which they were doing little things like inventing democracy and you know advanced mathematics and uh, philosophy and architecture and various other things, obviously they're not the only people who did architecture. But the refinement in architecture really is the foundation for most of what we consider um, advanced architecture in modern times. And that came from the Greeks. But the period of time during which all of that came in, came about was during the period of time when they were city-states, meaning each city was an individual political entity not connected in any official way with the other cities. Now, um, I've talked several times about the importance of geography to the growth of empires and to the development of nations. Egypt has one of the longest continuous histories ever of any, any nation because the natural barriers around it kept people from invading it anywhere from but the sea. And so it had to be a country that had a significant sea power to approach Egypt from the sea. Otherwise, you couldn't get across the desert or across the Red Sea um, on their eastern side. Whereas Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, is wide open. And that's why Egypt had a long, continuous history with relatively few invaders until late. Whereas Mesopotamia was one empire after another, after another, after another, because the geography allowed for that. Well, the thing about Greece, have any of you been to Greece, the, the, you know, the mainland of Greece? What's it look like? Hills. It's hills and mountains and valleys. In fact, it's so broken up that almost every valley that had even a village in it created their own political entity because it was too hard to get over the hills to someplace else. So very rarely did you have any sense. Now, some of these 
individual city-states or political entities in their various valleys, you know, across the mountains, from time to time they would connect with another and have treaties. But almost never, again until very modern times, was there a sense in which uh, Greece was in any way a nation as we think of nations. And that's important to understand the history of Greece. Now we've already looked at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use kind of a timeline orientation and then have some images in between. We've already talked about the fact that between about 1700 and 1200 or so, we had the Minoan and Mycenaean civilizations. Talked about all that this morning. Well, about 1200 or so was when we are told the Trojan War. That is the war between the city-state of Troy, which is on the Anatolian or Turkish uh, mainland, and the city-states that had joined together with Mycenae and with Sparta to try to retrieve Helen when they went at war with each other. So the Trojan War, it was right toward the end of the Mycenaean period. And so the Mycenaean period, the Minoan civilization, and the Mycenaean civilization are critical as sort of beginning places for Greek history. Um, and we talked about all that this morning. If you missed it, then wait a week or two and watch the video. Um, then we come to a period of time which is known as the Greek Dark Ages. And it really was the Dark Ages. Um, the period of time from about 1100 to 800, nobody traveled. People didn't communicate between villages. People forgot how to write. There was a massive decline in civilization, a plummeting of population. Everything went dark. In fact, the only people that traveled at all throughout the uh, what we know as the, the, the area of Greece were the storytellers. They didn't have one place they lived, and storytellers included people like Homer. Homer was a blind, tradition tells us, was a blind poet. And in those days, these poets would travel. Nobody traveled for trade or for anything else. But they would go from place to place, and they would tell the great stories that had come from the ancient period of the Greek civilization, and that included especially the stories of the Trojan War. Homer created two great epics that we're aware of. He may have had more than that, but we know of two. One is called the Iliad. The Iliad is the great story of the, uh, the Trojan War. The second one is called the Odyssey. The Odyssey is the story of one of the soldiers from the Greek side of the Trojan War, Odysseus, trying to get home after the war. And the gods keep preventing him by causing him to, all sorts of challenges he has to overcome in order to try to get back home and to his wife. But Homer, I said this morning, the writings of Homer, especially to the Greeks, the Iliad, more than the Odyssey, were the thing that defined their civilization following the Dark Ages. We believe that Homer probably created these epics about 750, so right at the end of the Dark Age period. They were not actually written down until about 500, so 250 years after Homer created them. And people historically had been very pessimistic about this idea that these people could remember all this without writing it down and tell these stories. Well, just a few years ago, some studies were done um, in areas, remote areas of Yugoslavia. They still have these, these storytellers that would go from place to place. Almost every culture has had those. Um, Ireland, they had storytellers like that called the Shanaki, right? So even as far away as Ireland, well, two scholars went to Yugoslavia and found one of these traditional sages and sat him down and said, without reading anything, without looking at anything, said, tell us your stories. After six days, they said, okay, 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 we believe you. <laughs> they estimated something like 500,000 words this person had memorized. And that's in a time when this sort of memorized recitation of historical, poetical kinds of forms. We don't have that anymore. Okay, he was just a remnant, a vestige of that history. Back in 750 BC, that's how, that's how they communicated their history and their poetry. It was how they lived. Um, and as I say, during the Dark Period, the Dark Ages, they had forgotten how to write, most of them. So now scholars are beginning to agree that yes, it's very possible that the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and many of the other great traditional oral uh, sources, like much of the uh, Hebrew Bible, for instance, didn't get written down until somewhat later, uh, that these things were memorized, and they were memorized accurately. So we don't have a problem with that. But Homer, as I said this morning, this Homer became so important.
to the Greeks, that is, all of the citizens of the Greek city-states, he identified for them what it mean to be, meant to be a Greek person. That meant to value this history, to value the, the ethics um, and the ethos that came out of this period that Homer reflected in the Iliad. The, this is the seeds of the whole classical period of Greece, was in Homer. Greek education, for centuries and centuries after this, the whole of Greek education involved memorizing and making comment on, on Homer. <laughs> It's said that Homer was more important than all of Shakespeare and the Judeo-Christian Bible put together to the Greeks. It actually defined for them what it meant to be Greek, right up until very modern times. So this identity, the exploits of Achilles, of Odysseus, and others taught them how to act. It gave them an ethic as well as giving them a sense of identity. Very, very important. We can't overplay that. The other thing that celebrated the end of the Dark Ages and also began to create some sense of a Greek identity. Again, these people belonged to, you ask them, okay, well, what nationality are you? They would have said, I'm Athenian, or I'm Spartan, or I'm Corinthian, or I'm Theban. Okay, they, they would not have said I'm Greek. In fact, they never called themselves Greeks. If they called themselves anything as a group, they were Hellenes, you know, part of Hellas. But the thing that gave them a sense of common um, uh, identity was first Homer and what he reflected and taught them and secondly the Olympic Games because the Olympic Games the first of which was in 776 BC that was the uh, the first event and then it happened every four years after that where people came from all these different Greek city-states and they would compete with each other and it wasn't just athletics they also competed in poetry and oratory um, it was a religious ceremony. This was done, the reason it was called the Olympic Games, it was done as an act of religious observance to the gods, the gods of Olympus. And so they would come together, it was an extended religious uh, event, and they would compete with each other, and then they would all go back home. During this period of time, there were truce, uh, pretty much universally truce. People could pass through lands where ordinarily they would be attacked as an enemy. They were allowed to go through in order to get to the Olympic Games. So it was very important that too gave them a sense of identity. The, the title of this talk is The Unlikely Rise of Greece. Well, one of the reasons why it is so unlikely that Greece would have developed the foundation for the Western culture they have is that they weren't even a nation. You know, there were a bunch of cities, and yet they overcame that separation in a way that gave us a fairly consistent direction into Western civilization. And during this time, we especially had the rise of a couple of those cities, Athens being one of them. I'll talk about Athens a little bit more later. Um, they, Athens became the site where there was more, they're the ones that invented democracy. There was more artistic and poetic um, expression probably out of Athens than anywhere else. But another city that actually was founded earlier in terms of a real founding was the city of Sparta. Again, in two days time, you will have an opportunity if you take the, the one of the excursions to visit the ruins of the ancient city of Sparta. Sparta was founded around 800 BC, in other words, right at the end of the Dark Ages. Um, and they were founded like any other Greek city, but fairly early on in the 700s, they decided that they were going to conquer this, the, the, the area next door to them, which was Mycenae. The Spartan military goes over, they conquer Mycenae, and they turn all of the citizens there effectively into slaves. They call them helots. Every Mycenaean farmer had an obligation. He had an owner who was from Sparta. He had to give half of everything he produced to that Spartan landlord. And Sparta maintained them as this service body. Um, they also acted as servants in Sparta. Several times early on, like in 650 BC, um, the helots rebelled and it took them 20 years or so to put down that rebellion they rebelled several times what happened was sparta developed this culture where they didn't work they had slaves from this this next door kingdom that did all of the work for them and provided their food and everything else the problem was those the helots of messenia didn't want to stay as slaves they kept rebelling and so sparta since they didn't have to work they focused all of their energy on creating a military structure so that they knew that they could protect themselves if the helots decided to rebel again. It's a very weird kind of cycle. 
And so Sparta created the most militarized society that probably we have ever known anywhere. We talk about a professional army. They didn't have a professional army because every adult male was part of the military. They, you've heard of having a Spartan existence. Well, they developed this sense that um, the whole purpose of their society was to create warriors, soldiers. And so the, the old guys, Jerusia, as they were called, which literally means the old guys. It's, it's from the same root of our geriatric. The Jerusia were a collection of 28 men who were 60 years old or older, and they ran the society. When a baby was born, the Jerusia would go and inspect the baby. If the baby was not considered to be sufficient, not healthy enough, or had any deformity or anything else, the baby was put out to the elements to die. The baby had to be pretty much perfect. And the child then was raised by his mother, his or her mother, until the age of seven. At age seven, the, they were both taken, either boys or girls were taken away from their mother. The boys were sent to basically a military boot camp. And this boot camp, they became part of what was called a herd, which was their age group within this camp. It was a communal camp. They never lived with their mothers again, their parents again. Girls were taken to a camp as well. The idea there was as soon as they got to childbearing age, their responsibility was to bear children, ideally male children, to feed the military needs. From age seven on, these boys, they were given a cloak to wear, no shoes, no blanket. Once a year, they could go out and gather reeds to make a bed for themselves, once a year. Um, they were um, in constant competitive uh, athletics, you know, uh, military battles and everything else. Any child, any boy that did not succeed, you know, that consistently failed was ridiculed so that they had a very high suicide rate. And the whole idea was making them tough. They were intentionally underfed so that the boys would either go out and steal or, you know, just take it away from somebody weaker than them. Again, thinking that was going to build them, make them stronger and fiercer, that sort of thing. Um, at When they reached age 20, they graduated, and their graduation ceremony was what was called a cryptea. And that was they were sent out Again, with no weapons, no extra clothing. And by the way, it snows in the area around Sparta. It's in the mountains. They didn't have shoes, didn't let them wear shoes, no coats, nothing. But the Kryptea, with their graduation ceremony, they were to go out on their own, sneak over to Mycenae, sneak into the home of a helot, and kill him. And then come back. And then they had graduated. And in fact, these boys, when they were in this communal camp, they had permission whenever they were out on maneuvers or whatever, if they came across, uh, across a helot that was not where they ought to be, they could kill them. And nobody, you know, that was a good thing. Good, good practice. So all of this was oriented around creating the most uh, efficient military ever. And they were very good at that. Again, you saw the movie 300, some of you. It's the story of where King Leonidas, uh, the Spartan king, with his 300 guards, and help from a few Thebans and Thespians and other, other Greek folks, held off the whole of Xerxes' um, army, Persian army, of tens of thousands at the pass of Thermopylae. And if they had not been betrayed by a guide who, who showed the Persians a way to get around behind them, who knows how long they could have lasted. But in the few days they held out, 300 plus some, held out against tens of thousands in that pass, that gave an opportunity for the other armies to retreat, to gather their forces, and to prepare to fight the Persians. The Spartans were tough. In fact, um, they quote this in the movie, and apparently it's a real quote. One of the emissaries that the Persians had sent forward to talk to the Spartans and say, you guys are nuts. You know, we don't want to kill you. This is not a competition for us. Little did he know. And he said, just surrender. And the guy, they said, we're not, we're not going to surrender. We're Spartans. And apparently it's true that the guy said, we will rain so many arrows down on you that they will blot out the sun. And the response from one of the junior commanders was, then we will fight in the shade. <laughs> These were tough guys. That was the army of Sparta, and it became one of the most important of the city-states. Now, they never produced any art. They didn't leave behind any buildings to speak of. Um, they didn't do any trade. In fact, one of the things that they did, equality, was absolutely necessary because every soldier had to stand shoulder to shoulder and be like a replaceable piece of the machine. 
So they, they actually forbade the ownership of gold or silver. There was virtually no trade. If you had to buy something, you used a piece of iron, which nobody else wanted, you know, and so they would, they, they would trade iron internally. A very, very different kind of culture, these Spartans, but fascinating. So this is the Dark Age, right at the end of which, about 800 uh, BC, 900, 800, is when the Age of Sparta, the Homeric epics were written, written down, and we begin to move toward classical Greek civilization. And again, all of these slides will be available to you. The next period I want to talk about um, is the really moving toward, it's, we're now into the classical period, uh, this is the time from 525 to 380. This was a, a, an, about a 150-year period where we see the development of some of the great art, uh, particularly the written arts. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes were some of the great writers and playwrights of uh, Greek. They, you know, they're still done today. Uh, some of them were comedic writers. Some of them very serious writers. Really good stuff. Aristophanes did some hilarious things. Okay. Um, and I recommend it to you sometime. You probably want to read it in English translation, but uh, that would be really good. Um, it also is that we come into the period of time from 497 to 479, the Persian Wars, which I talked to you about earlier. Um, this was what the area we know of as Greek looked like at that time. I mentioned the fact that Thermopylae, this pass here, was where the Spartans, 300 Spartans and some others, held off the Persian army. Well, what happened, very quickly, because I talked about this before, um, the area along the border of Asia Minor, the area that's orange here, those were the Ionian cities, that's the Ionian coast. Those cities, after the Trojan War, they saw themselves as aligned with Greece. They spoke Greek. You all went to Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the Ionian cities. And they talked about it like it was a Greek city, even though it's, it's in Turkey, what used to be Anatolia, and was part of the Persian Empire. So these cities rebelled around 500 BC from Persia. Greece, especially Athens, supported them. The uh, king of kings, the greatest of all kings, the Persian Empire was the greatest one that ever existed till then. Darius comes over and he's gonna not only put the Ionian rebellion down, but he's gonna teach Athens a lesson. He crosses over the Battle of Marathon. Marathon is right here. Was the place at which, uh, in 490 BC, to everyone's surprise, including the Greeks, the Greek army defeated the Persians. In fact, the stories are that there were only 192 Greeks killed versus 6,400 Persians. So they beat them quite decisively. And Darius climbs back on his boats and takes his people back. The guy uh, runs from uh, Philippides, I think his name was, ran from the plain of Marathon to Athens, 26.2 miles, to report the victory and then fell over dead. That's where we get a marathon, as I talked about earlier. Um, at this point, the Athen Athenians know that Persia is not done. They're not going to just go away. Later on, the uh, descendant of Darius, whose name was Xerxes, comes back, and that, that's actually when the, the, the Therm Thermopylae uh, battle takes place. I mentioned it earlier, but this is when it happens, the second invasion. And Xerxes both brings his troops by ship, and he, land, he goes overland from the north. They come in. Athens know that know they can't beat this huge army, much bigger than the first one. They desert Athens. And Xerxes and his army come in and they burn the city of Athens. Because the Athenians have run off and they can't chase them, they leave. But before that happened, there was a man who was one of the generals called Themistocles. He was a Greek general, and during the period of time between the first and second uh, invasion by the Persians, they had, um, Athens had discovered a silver mine, and they had a lot of extra money. Well, at first, they, were, they decided, we're going to take all this money we're getting from the silver mine, and we're going to divide it up and give it to all the people, make them like us. And uh, Themistocles convinced them, no, let's take that money and build a navy. He convinces them they build 200 ships. These are called triremes. These triremes, they're called triremes because they have three levels, three rows of, of uh, rowers, one on top of the other. 200 triremes, so when Xerxes comes in, burns Athens, he has his navy with him. Well, Themistocles 
takes the Greek navy, which is smaller, and he looks like he's running away from the navy of the Persians. His ships are smaller and quicker. Looks like he's running away, and he goes in here. There's an area, there's an island called uh, Salamis. There's a strait between that island and the mainland. Well, uh, Themistocles takes his navy in there, in their bigger ships, the Persians follow him. Themistocles has his ships turn around because they're smaller and quicker and can maneuver in that narrow pass. They end up destroying the Persian navy, which was far larger. Xerxes was sitting up on the hillside above the Bay of Salamis watching this. And when all of his ships get destroyed, he, he can't supply his army anymore. He has no connection. He takes what few ships he has left and uh, sins for more, they load up on their boats and they go home. In fact, he left as quickly as he could and he left part of his army behind. Mm -hmm. They had to just do the best they could. So the, the Athenians and some of their partners in the, the Greeks were just thrilled about this. Um, they thought that the gods had shown their favor and so they decide that they're going to celebrate by rebuilding Athens and making it far better than it ever was before. This brings us into an, a period of time which is generally called the Golden Age. But, um, and I'll mention some parts of that. But at the same time that they've defeated Persia, Greece, Athens especially, knows they're still, they're likely to come back again. They're still the largest power the world has ever seen, and we have just kicked their booty twice. So they may come back. So at that point, Greece creates what's called the Delian League. We come into the classical period here. The Delian League, which was a, a, an affiliation, a partnership with a lot of the other city-states and islands in the Aegean Sea so they could join together to be prepared to fight back uh, with each other if the Persians come back. This Delian League eventually becomes what's, what's called the Athenian Empire. It's the closest to an empire that Greece ever really had other than Alexander the Great, who actually wasn't Greek, he was Macedonian. But this is a time when Athens starts showing their leadership. They're the ones that organize this Delian League. And all of the yellow parts here, the, the orange is, the, is a region called Attica, which surrounds Athens. So all of that and all of these yellow parts joined together in what was called the Delian League, with Athens as the leadership. But unfortunately, Athens was feeling so good about the fact that they were responsible for beating the Persians twice that they start getting really bossy. They start telling other people what to do. Um, and they, every, all of these different islands, different city-states are required to contribute to the treasury for this Delian League. And the money is kept on the island of Delos. That's why it's called the Delian League. Well, one of the islands, after a number of years pass, and there's no sign of the Persians showing up again, uh, this, the island of Naxos says, you know, we don't see why we should keep giving money when we're not spending it for anything. Um, and in fact, Athens, we've noticed that you've started rebuilding your city and you haven't explained where all of that money came from. So what's going on here? So Naxos said, we want out of the league. And Athens said, you can't. And Naxos says, well, yeah, we can. Athens said, watch. And they, so they blockaded the island of Naxos, conquered them, forced them to pay tribute, and forced them to continue to pay money to the Delian League. At that point, when Athens started beating up on their own allies, uh, everybody else started getting afraid of them. Nobody else tried to get out of the Delian League, but at that point they all started acknowledging that Athens was more than just the leader. It was their gig. They were the, they were the guys. And it became known as the Athenian Empire. At that point, Athens said, by the way, we will take the treasury out of the island of Delos and keep it on the Acropolis for safekeeping. <laughs> Once they got that money, they then started rebuilding all of, uh, that's when the period of time when the Acropolis was built, all of the beautiful temples, a lot of the other things in the city of Athens. They were using the money that had been contributed by all these other city-states, plus the money that, some money they had from those silver mines, to rebuild their own city. And everybody else, they had become a tyrant over all of the other members of the Stelian League, and had formed a, an empire. Because of that, because of their bossiness, this was the start of the Peloponnesian War. Now, first there were the Persian Wars, which we talked about. Now, and, and by the way, this was when history was invented. History as we know history. 
The first historian, the man who's called the father of history, is named Herodotus. Herodotus wrote the history of the Persian Wars. And in the process, it was the first time that anybody ever tried to give at least a fairly objective analysis. History before that was telling our side if we won and making us look really good and making the other guy look really bad. Herodotus, although he admittedly, and he, and he actually included that, he admitted his when he gave his own opinions, but for the most part, that was where history began. And so the history of the Persian Wars was Herodotus' contribution. After that, we uh, the Peloponnesian Wars come along, and you'll notice there's two sets of dates on that. I'm going to back up to the other one so we're not confusing that. Um, the Peloponnesian Wars, there was a first period of time. Would you, would you mind asking them to close that door? Could, you, could somebody go and ask them to close that door? I find it very distracting that they're talking right there, and that's just me. Thanks very much. Um, tell them I, I asked them to do that. Um, the Peloponnesian War, there was a period of time in which Sparta joined with Corinth and some others in opposition to the Delian League. They created what they called the Peloponnesian League, and it was entirely to say to Athens, we're not going to let you have your way about everything. The first period of time you see here, uh, 461 to 445, was mostly posturing. It was mostly threats, a few little combats, no big deal. Then the period of time between 445 and 431 was like the Cold War. You had this significant military power in Sparta and versus another significant military power in Athens, and they each had their allies. So you had these Peloponnesian League and the Delian League sort of standing off on stuff. Well, then enough was enough, and Sparta attacked Athens in 431. And that was the full-blown start of the Peloponnesian War. Well, there's a lot of overlap here because during this period of time is the Golden Period. That's when Pericles, whose name you might have heard, was the leader of Athens. He's the one who initiated a lot of the development and growth. He's the one that supported, as the leader of Athens, the development of philosophy and a lot of the classical architecture and that sort of thing. So this is the golden period in the Athenian time, but at the same time, war is brewing. And because Pericles, as a great leader, knew that war was coming, how many, most of you all uh, were in Athens and then you took a taxi to Piraeus, the port, right? So you know how far it is. Pericles came up with the idea, because Sparta was such a powerful land army, and Athens had a powerful navy. That's how they had defeated the Persians with their navy. Per Pericles built a wall all the way around the city of Athens, all the way down to the coastline, encompassing Piraeus, hmm. which meant they could go from Athens to uh, the city to their ships in Piraeus without having to be outside their walls. And so you end up with the Spartan army parked right outside the walls of Athens, threatening them, but not able to get in. The Athenians able to get to their ships, but from their ships they couldn't do anything against the Spartan, and the Spartans didn't have an navy to speak of. They couldn't do anything against the Spartan army on land. Somebody said that, it, and it went on like this for forever. You know, the Spartans on the land and the Athenians on the sea, they're fighting a war and yet they can't get at each other. Someone said it was like a war between an elephant and a whale. <laughs> you know, not a lot of evidence of anything happening, even though they were at war. And Pericles' idea was, look, leave them out there. We're not going to be cut off from supplies because they had ships to bring in food. We're going to be fine. Let's just sit behind our walls and let them get tired out there. And that was all going really well until Athens was hit with a plague. We don't know if it was bubonic plague or typhoid fever or what it was, but a lot of people died, including Pericles. When Pericles died, other people stepped in, and they thought, we're tired of waiting, we're going to do something. And they said, what are we going to do? Well, it has to involve our navy. The Spartans had, they didn't plant many colonies. They pretty much were self-sufficient. And in fact, they had trouble maintaining their population anyway because they put so many babies out to die. And because people, men, once men and women, when they married, they were not allowed to live together. The men had to live, even as adults, they had to live in a communal group with their military unit, and they only got to go and visit their wives. So they had fewer babies being born, more babies being killed. Sparta didn't have a lot of soldiers.
but the one place that they had invested was on Sicily. So somebody, after Pericles is dead, says, okay, we can take our navy, load it up with our army, go to Sicily, attack Sicily, which was an investment that the, the Spartans had, and Sparta will have to stop attacking the city of Athens in order to do something about that. Well, they went to Sicily and got soundly defeated by the army in Sicily, the army and navy in Sicily. Their navy was almost destroyed, their army was defeated, they no longer had a navy to speak up, they didn't have an army to speak up, they ended up having to surrender to Sparta. You know, if Pericles had not died from the plague, they probably would have been all right. So this misguided trip to Sicily led to the defeat of Athens and the development of the growth of Sparta as the major power. That lasted for some period of time, although Sparta wasn't big on governing anybody else. They wanted to be left alone. Sparta wanted to be Sparta, to live their Spartan existence. And so eventually that sort of declined. During this period of time is the period of the great philosophical, or somewhat slightly earlier, was the great artistic growth and development. This is the period of time when we have the great philosophical development. Socrates, his student Plato, Aristotle, the foundation of Western philosophical thinking. Um, this was the time when Epicureanism, um, here and a little bit later, Epicureanism, Stoicism, other philosophical schools, obviously Platonism with Plato comes along. And so the astonishing thing is, is for all of their fighting each other, for all of their division into very tiny little city-states, for the fact that they never were, even in their most, you know, most expansive state, they never did cover much territory as the Greeks. Still, this is the civilization that gave us philosophy, mathematics, architecture, medicine, uh, Hippocrates, you know, the Hippocratic Oath that doctors swear now. Hippocrates, what do you think he was? He was an Athenian Greek. And so medicine as we know it came from that period. So following the, the period of time with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, I mentioned Aristotle in an earlier talk. What did I tell you Aristotle did? Tutor. He was the tutor of Alexander the Great. The next period, um, I didn't show you the slide, this is the golden age. This is Pericles. Uh, on the bottom right, obviously, is where he is, um, where they built the Acropolis, the beautiful temples on top of the Acropolis in the center of, of Athens. The development of much of the beautiful art. The, the male human body was an object of much of their art because they believed that to be the most beautiful of all things. Um, women were okay, but they thought they thought the male body was the ultimate in beauty, and so that's why you see so many male sculptures. Wit and, man, and the males were always nude. Women sometimes were represented, but always draped, and the drapes initially were all kind of clunky. Later on, because somebody decided that the female figure was kind of nice too, but it didn't seem acceptable to them, unlike the Minoans, to show the woman the female figure. They, they still covered it, but they developed what was called the wet drape method. <laughs> Later Greek uh, sculptures of women, they'll be wearing drapes and gowns, but, you know, leaves very little of the imagination, even though technically they're still represented as having clothing on. The upper right-hand corner is um, the death of Socrates. I said that Sparta took over, Athens declined after Pericles. They had some terrible leaders. And one of the things they did, as often happens in human societies, is they started looking around for somebody to blame. Whose fault is it that we have reached this, this low point where we, the great Athens, have been defeated by, you know, this, these uh, Spartans who don't do anything but run around beating each other up? Well, they started looking around, and the one person in Athens that was probably the least popular person ever was named Socrates. Socrates was brilliant, horribly ugly, by all, all representations, and, and horribly cantankerous. He told everybody exactly what he thought, because he thought that the whole key to wisdom is to be able to analyze the unexamined mind, uh, life is not worth living. You need to look at yourself and what you're thinking and how you're living very hard, and if you're not doing it right, change it. And he took it upon himself to go around telling everybody, including the leadership of the city, what was wrong with them and what they needed to change. And so when they were looking for somebody to blame, they picked Socrates, and they accused him of destroying the morals of the youth because of the way he talked. And he was tried, did, he provided no defense, 
he was found guilty, and uh, then when they vote, not everybody voted on him being guilty, but when they then voted on the punishment he was to receive, they voted death. More people voted for him to be executed than voted that he was guilty, of all things. Um, which one commentary I, read, I have read said that that just proves that people are either stupid or they're not paying attention, <laughs> or both. Um, and so he was, he was sentenced to be executed. The thing is, it was customary in those days for a popular figure, if they were arrested, or even if they were told they were going to be executed, to be allowed to sort of slip away in the night and go away, leave the city, go into ex self-exile, and that was just expected. So when they voted to execute, and probably why more people voted to execute, because they didn't think it was going to be carried out, they thought he would leave. Well, when they put him in prison and his disciples, his followers, came to him and said, okay, you know, Socrates, let's go. He went, no. I was found guilty, I was sentenced to death, and I will accept that. And so they brought him a cup of hemlock, which was the traditional way, and he drank it. And so this is a painting representing the death of Socrates and his grieving. And for Socrates, it was as much as anything else a, um, a point of saying, you people just don't know how screwed up you are. And so I'll show you. And he killed himself. You know, I mean, it was, it was executed, but he had the choice. Um, a bit, one of the worst scenes... Um, in all of Greek history. Uh, it, and it really shook them up, I think. But um, at that same time, again, Aristotle was the philosopher in this time. He became the tutor of Alexander the Great, and starting in 338, we have what's called the Macedonian period, where Philip II of Macedon conquered all of the surrounding uh, areas, including Greece. He is assassinated. His son Alexander takes over, conquers most of the known world, and after his death is what is considered the tra traditionally considered as the Hellenistic period, where the Greek culture, language, arts, etc., that um, Alexander had learned from Aristotle and from reading Homer and from the other Greek arts and literature that was spread throughout the known world. So we have Alexander, well, Philip in the upper left, Alexander, and his great empire. The astonishing part of all this, as I said, is if you looked at it objectively, there is no possible way that the city-states of Greece should have been able to do all that they did. But um, having said that, it may be that their isolation actually gave them a slight advantage. Example, in Athens, they went through a bunch of different kinds of government. Because they were so small, because the city of Athens was just that, the city of Athens, the leaders of that city could say, well, let's try this. They didn't have a whole nation that they had to try to get to approve this. They could pretty much talk to everybody that was a citizen that had any influence, which meant a male who owned property, to find out what they think. And so we had a period during the 500s, we, they had a period during the 500s, in which first they said, okay, things are not going well. You know, they had several tyrants. Now, their word tyrant does not mean uh, an awful person. It doesn't mean somebody who's vicious or, or kills people. All it means, the Greek word tyrant, means a powerful man. And these were powerful men who managed to take over authority. It doesn't mean that they were executing everybody. But they went through a series of very bad tyrants. And finally... The leaders in Athens said, okay, we need to do something about this. There's this guy over here who's very smart, and he seems like a just guy, and um, we think that we ought to go to him and say, what would you do if we put you in charge? And so they did. Uh, the man's name was Salon. They made him, they said, okay, you're king. You can do whatever you want. You have unlimited power. Well, of course, they say traditionally that absolute power corrupts absolutely. But in this case, Salon, absolute power, he looked and said, the problem we have is inequity between the poor and the rich. And so he forgave all debts. Can you imagine? And they told him he could do anything because they trusted him. He forgave all debts. He, if anybody owed uh, on their house or their, their farm, they now owned it. They tore up all the papers. He then created um, four categories of citizens, the top two of which 
could share in the leadership. That was an early form of democracy. But then, later on, about 85 years later, they started having some problems again, so they did the same thing. The leaders, and it really was an oligarchy up till that point, it was the wealthy landowners were the two classes that could be elected. But they said, okay, we're messed up again, let's try this. It was pretty good under Salon, let's see what we can do. So they appoint a guy named Cleisthenes. And they say, Cleisthenes, you have power to do whatever you want. Well, Cleisthenes, instead of having four parties, he took everybody and created ten tribes, he called them. Everybody got assigned to a tribe, but it was random. You know, count from one to ten. Okay, you're a four, you're a three, you're a two. And then he created what was the first true democracy in history, probably, um, that we know of. There may have been some minor democracy somewhere else. But he created what was called the Council of the 500. They were like the Senate. They were the governing body. Of the ten tribes he created, each of them, every year, got to contribute 50 representatives. And those 50 representatives were selected at random. They weren't elected. They just said, you know, draw a number out of a hat. Okay, for the next year, you're one of the rulers. They had 500 of these people randomly selected. They were re-selected every year. Statistically, that meant that every citizen, every eligible male, had the likelihood of being able to serve on the Council of 500 twice in their lifetime. And that 500 people had all the authority. Randomly selected from all different classes, they're the ones that ran. And again, a true democracy, not a republic, when you elect the officials and they decide that's a republic, these actually were lay people who didn't run for office, randomly selected, they ran the government of Athens. And that actually was the, the foundation of democracy that led, that was in the 508 that Cleisthenes did this, that led to the 400s, which was the time that the Athens grew to the golden period, all right? uh, the golden age. And so democracy, medicine, architecture, uh, advanced mathematics, you name it, all of Western culture uh, that we think of as technological or in any way advanced comes from those little unlikely city-states like Athens. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Anything about the Greeks? Oh, those Greeks. Plus they gave us dolmades, they gave us, you know, lamb, all kinds of other things, right? Thank you all for your extraordinary attention and faithfulness in coming to these talks over the last, uh, how long has it been? Two months, three months? I appreciate it. Please do take advantage of the videos if you would like to access that or get the materials that's available in there. And I hope to be able to see you all in some future cruise.